Welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we're honored to be sitting down and speaking with Summerside Councillor Justin Duran. Explore authentic island experiences in the city by the sea. Summerside is Prince Edward Island's second largest city filled with culinary, cultural, and coastal experiences. Discover the energy of island Celtic roots, stroll the city streets, or watch the horses dash to the finish line. Awaken your soul and explore Summerside. So stay tuned and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Summerside Councillor Justin Duran. In the heart of every thriving community lies a well-crafted strategic plan. But crafting such a plan requires expertise, experience, and a deep understanding of local needs. Enter Strategic Steps, your partner in municipal strategic planning. Strategic Steps team of experts have years of experience in municipal administration at Strategic Steps, they just don't develop plans. They co-create homegrown strategies tailored to your unique community. They listen, they collaborate, they empower your community to thrive. Contact Strategic Steps today and take the first step towards a brighter future for your municipality. Call Strategic Steps at 780-416-9255 or visit strategicsteps.ca to get started. Counselor, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by getting to know the man behind the persona a little bit, if you don't mind. And I've got to ask a simple question, and that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from, Justin? Great question. Um, and first of all, it's fantastic to be here. It was uh, just a great experience running into you at uh, FCM. And and uh, no, I hope this is the start of... Uh, Another uh, another networking opportunity, but um, to uh, to answer your question, I guess it would have been two elections ago, which I, uh, in Summerside, uh, all over Prince Edward Island, we hold our municipal elections on the same day. I'm not sure if that's the same across the country or not, but um, regardless, it was the election of 2014, um, and I had missed the uh, opportunity to um, put my name forward, and at that time, I wasn't even considering it, but um, a coworker and I decided to attend. Um, it was a debate. Um, the the mayoral candidates had a debate, but all of the uh, councillor candidates were given an opportunity to just sort of do a speech and, and introduce themselves. And so, um, so we went to that. And I don't know something. I think triggered it during that presentation where I thought, "Hey, this I know these people." Um, you know, the city is smaller than I sort of imagined it being. Um, so anyway, the event came and went and, uh, you know, I voted whatever. And, and four years went by and, and the municipal elections came up again. And I sort of caught myself thinking back to four years prior, thinking how sort of, uh, you know, triggered triggered might not be a, a good word these days but how uh <laughs> how that event sort of spurred the interest um and i thought about it for for a few days and and talked to some friends and and decided that i would run and that was 20 uh 2018 and i became successful and and here we are another another term later was mom and dad political or where did you get your political bug not from? at all no no it was more of not at all. No, it was more of just, uh, well, I should back up. My grandfather was actually the uh, lieutenant governor from 1980 to 85. <laughs> Not that, and I mean, he 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 passed before I really had an opportunity to get, get to know him. So, I mean, I guess it's in, it's in the blood, but, but to say that that directly influenced me, I, I don't think so because I didn't, I didn't know him personally and, and, and very well anyway, as a, as a more mature young adult, but um, no, politi politics doesn't run in the family. Well, it does now, so, I guess. We'll see what my son I, does. <laughs> I, I looked at your resume with a background in uh, uh, aviation, background in the Royal Navy. I can imagine municipal politics was probably not something, <laughs> from an outsider's perspective, would have been my first guess to say, Justin's career trajectory is going to start municipally, maybe federally, maybe provincially. 
what was it about that municipal allure, the municipal aura that said Justin's best career path would be to start at city council in the city of Summerside? <laughs> oh, what a loaded <laughs> question, but a very good and not confusing question. It's a great question. Um, and I think, and I hope this answer doesn't sound cliched. I don't know how municipal uh, leaders sort of address that topic in bigger centers, but um, it really is the sort of the grassroots level. It, you're the closest to your residents, to your neighbors, to the people that you know. Um, I find, and having no experience in provincial or federal politics, I don't know if this is true, but I find that there almost seems to be a disconnect sometimes between the actual uh, politicians at those levels and the actual residents. Whereas municipally, I mean, you can get a call. I'll, I'll, I'll echo uh, Mayor Quitcher's sort of comments that he made to you a few weeks ago. Um, you could get a call one day about, I think his reference was long grass. And then the next day you can hear from a, a whole neighborhood that wants to talk about uh, rezoning bylaws and that sort of thing. So it's just every day is is different. Every issue is different. Every neighbor is different. And, and they are your neighbors that you represent. It's not like uh, provincially you have a a, a, a ginormous um, region in your province and you may not know everyone not that I know everyone in my in my ward but it's just such a nice low level uh position and and there's no parties so you don't have to uh be loyal to a, a red or a blue or a green or an orange or a whatever um, whatever color yeah, is out there right now <laughs> yeah yeah your residents vote for you and not not your party you now have been on council for six years. So elected in 2018, re-elected in 2022. You've probably had to make some very tough decisions around that council table. And the decisions Absolutely, you yeah. make impact your residents the day you make them. Unlike provincial where it could take a few weeks or months, federal a few years or potentially a decade, the decisions you make impact people the next day. Looking at those decisions, how do you make that decision at the end of the day? Is there a filter that you place on every issue that's put in front of you to go through a checklist, a mental checklist, or a, I don't want to say uh, a, a litmus test, but I kind of have to, to ensure that the decision you make will impact people of your community the best, but potentially impact people also negatively as well? Yeah. Yeah, well, our uh, our municipal government act states that you must represent the city as a whole before you try to individualize your own wards. So, number one, you got to we really have to keep that in mind because there's so much. Is that hard to, to do? Yes, it can be. It kind of depends on the decision at hand. If it's something that sort of has a bit of maybe not controversy, but if it's one of those issues that really divide people, then yeah, it can be, it can be really tricky because it's the people of your ward that elect you or, or reelect you. If, if you want to run again, it's not necessarily the other seven wards. So yeah, you absolutely have to balance what you're legislated to do versus the people that can throw you out of the curb in four years. Um, but yeah, and another, another huge, um, factor in in I think every one of us making decisions. Um, when I say every one of us, I mean every every councillor. Um, we have an absolutely fantastic staff here, um, and they obviously provide us the recommendations, and we make our decisions or we 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 vote based on um, the input from staff. It's not just the input from staff, but we have such a great staff and the director of every department. And they're able to not only recommend A or B or C, but they can say, you know, if you pick A, this is the, you know, series of events that may happen, either pro or con, if you pick B. They're, so they're able to sort of give you an outlook of not just what you support, but the what may happen down the road if you do not support certain things so it's not like we're just given vote yay or nay they're the staff are really good at sort of laying out 
um, the chain of events that could happen either way. And we, so we, we, we certainly rely on the advice from staff with pretty much every decision that we make, because we're all just at the end of the day, our expertise is not, you know, planning or, or finance or whatever. So um, yes, we're the vehicle to make that decision and to push that policy, but we absolutely rely on expert advice and, and, and the input from residents and, you know, and we, and our official plan that we have to look at, you know, there's, there's different criteria in there that we always have to um, reference as well. So do you get a sense that the people of Summerside actually want to give opinions on what's going on municipally? When I talk to municipal leaders across this country, I hear an apathetic tone from residents towards their municipal, I, I don't want to say people, but municipal infrastructure, municipal challenges that are being faced with. Do you get a sense in Summerside that people want to give their opinion and their feedback on what's going on at City Hall? I do. I really do. Um, and I think part of that is owed to, um, like, our council is, although we have a couple of um, more experienced councillors, um, everyone around the table is really, uh, since, our, since my first term in 2018, everyone, whether they're young, new councillors, or whether they've been around the table for a few years, they're very good at um, social media. Um, whereas in years prior to that, it was a lot of counselors had been there for, um, <laughs> you know, a few terms, terms and they hadn't embraced that vehicle yet. Um, whereas all eight of us, plus the mayor, we're, I don't know, for the generation, we are a very young council, but yeah, I find that we're very good at um, just putting stuff out there. And of course, with social media, it opens up comments, especially with uh, with, with like Facebook. Um, and I find people are extremely engaged. And I mean, I can't speak for everyone because some, not everyone has social media. Um, but it's it's yeah, people are extremely extremely engaged. And I I mean, I, I can only speak for myself. I don't know who of the others are getting you know the feedback, the messages. Um, but uh, but I love. It. I mean, I'll just I'll just post. You know, I post agendas online and my reaction to things and the reasoning why I vote one way or another. And I think residents appreciate that, whether they agree with those votes or not. Um, but yeah, I find them, our residents are extremely interested and engaging, especially the last couple of years where housing has been such a such an issue and and, and we're trying to do so much to address that. And, and yeah, residents are just sort of grasped onto some of the things that we're doing here. You you talk about the resident engagement, and I can imagine for yourself because I've I've followed you on social media for some time now of since we met at FCM and we've gotten to know each other a little bit through that it's brief encounter. It seems like you're willing to have a conversation with anyone, and you made a mention the fact that not everyone's going to agree with the decisions you make at that council table. So how important is it for yourself to listen to both sides of the issue, whether it be those who agree with the uh, issue that you've decided on or those who disagree with you, because you're there to represent everyone, even the ones who disagree with you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I find that it's so much more easier to not put up that wall of, communicating with residents than it is to just sort of leave it wide open um yeah um is it challenging lock, because it, is actual... it challenging because i can imagine there's times when you've made a decision you have to stand by the decisions you make but then when people then come to you and say now you're going to affect me this way or that way and you're going i wish you would have brought this to me beforehand yeah. so when we talk about that engagement aspect is it better to go out before a decision is made or after a decision is made and try to sell your opinion yeah well i mean we're sort of obligated to not <laughs> make our minds up before the vote Woo! um <laughs> breaking the news here the people are not supposed up. to make up their minds here <laughs> what come on <laughs> Until because right up until when we vote here in a council meeting, we have information coming in right up until that vote is called. Um, so for us to sort of pick a position before we have all the information, um, it really opens up for appeals or, or 
conflict. Have so, you been swayed by a decision? Have you been swayed absolutely. by something that is okay? I should let you finish in case you're going to say something that I don't think you're going to say. But yeah, I no, mean, I was I've, gonna... I've mine made up, and then and then the the, the motion is floored uh, or tabled rather, and and there's an opportunity for councils to you know councillors to go around the room. And anybody want to add anything? And and somebody might say something, and it just yeah, I didn't think of that. So absolutely, it I, yeah, and yeah, and and a lot of residents say depending on what the topic is, all their minds are made up, but no, it absolutely can change right before a vote. Um, and it's, it I don't think it's about weighing. It's just about, I had not considered that, or that's new information that I didn't even know. So yeah. Yeah. I, I, I watch my fair share of council meetings and I, Summerside does this unique thing and I'm not sure if it's just Summerside or if it's all councils in Prince Edward Island, but you have questions from the audience literally while the council meeting is going on and people can ask councillors questions about what's going on. Is that unique to Summerside or is that just a uh, Prince Edward Island? Because I was watching a council meeting from back in March around housing and you were the, you were presenting a, a report about development and infrastructure and there was some exchange. It might not have been someone from the audience. It might've been a staff member that you were bouncing a question off of, but it seemed like you want people to engage with their councillors. Absolutely. And I think it might be a provincial a provincially legislated thing within our municipal government act um at least when it be, when it, with regards to um like rezonings we have so many of those and part of the process is to consider input and feedback from residents so at every rezoning meeting uh there's a section in our agendas that allow comments or questions from the floor um so that's probably what you're referring to. But that being okay. said, if we're having a meeting and it's of an issue that might be a little contentious and there's somebody in the in the gallery that just decides to speak up, I mean, we, we have the ability to allow it or 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 not. That's part of our procedural bylaw. As long as there's a consensus among council to allow whoever it is to, to speak, um, we'll, we'll allow it. Yeah, and I think that's part of the beauty of living in a smaller center um typically uh, a smaller center being the second largest <laughs> city in the province of prince Edward yeah. Island. But okay <laughs> even the first largest even the first largest city is smaller than you know new brunswick's smallest city so <laughs> um, yeah uh, yeah uh, before we turn to the next segment and that is summerside as a whole we have people who listen to this show or watch the show who are thinking about putting their names on the ballot in the upcoming general election, whether that be in Nova Scotia, which are heading to the polls later on this year, Saskatchewan heading to the polls this summer, and then later on this year as well, Northwest Territories, uh, some of are heading to the polls in December, and then the Yukon. What advice would you give a prospective candidate who is thinking about putting their name on the ballot municipally that you wish you would have known prior to entering into the political arena in 2018? Two things kind of come to mind. Um, the first one is simply attend a few of your city or town's council meetings. Just just go and watch and see how it operates. That's something that I didn't do. Um, and the reason that I would advise doing that is because if you are successful, you'll sort of have that knowledge of how things are run and you'll you'll spend less time catching up to the procedural uh things um mind you depending on the size of your city or town or municipality it might not be that difficult of a thing to to hang on to if you just jump right in but but for me there's a lot of little nuances and things that happen in the meetings that i wish i would have known going right in because i spent a lot of time sort of is this when i talk or is, is this when we are able to do this or it seemed like going into it, it seemed like a very sort of, I don't know, regal type sort of event where it's really, we really are laid back. And I wish I would kind of would have known that going in. Um, and the second thing would just be, if you have the opportunity, just talk to one or two or some of your counselors that you're familiar with and comfortable with, and just talk to them and ask them, you know, what's it like and how is it like for you um, without seeming like you're, 
threatening their job in the next election. But I mean, I've had a couple of people reach out to me. We've had a couple of by-elections and, you know, friends of mine that were sort of interested and they just wanted to, you know, bounce some questions off me. And yeah, so that'd be, that'd be, I think the answer to your, to your question, just attend some meetings or, or one, if you can only attend one and, and just reach out to your counselor and just have a chat with them and ask them what it's like. Um, I want to turn to the city of Summerside as a whole now, but before I do that, I want to preface this question by saying this. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council, not a direction of council, not a policy of council. This is his opinion and his opinion alone. For those who are about to send me nasty emails, please don't. <laughs> this is his opinion. That being said, in your opinion, councillor, um, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing the city of Summerside today? I think, and it's not even really a municipal um, jurisdiction, but I think our health care, our hospital um, sort of health, just staffing across the board in our, in our provincial health uh, organization and just the ability for people to attain um, housing it's housing and healthcare. i think that's the biggest issue in summerside mind you those are two things that the city doesn't have direct control over but those are our biggest if you ask residents they're going to say i don't have a doctor or i don't have a place to live those are it's got to be hands down um tied for number one those those issues okay you've just you've just taken my question out of the realm but i'm going to ask it anyway these are two not municipal jurisdictional issues alone but municipalities across Canada are playing in that sandbox more and more in the last few years, I would say highly since probably COVID-19, since the end of the pandemic. What is the city of Summerside doing and what are you and council doing, the Royal U.S. Council, doing to ensure that your residents have adequate access to health care or able to get into a first-time house in your community? Yeah, well, I think we're more directly involved with the housing side of things as the healthcare. I mean, for, for the healthcare piece, I mean, we can advocate and and you know that sort of thing, but we have less of a direct ability to control how that issue sort of evolves. Um, we can tell people to call your MLA, and and you know we we stand behind their hospital, but in terms of housing, we sort of have more of an ability to control some of that um, by, you know, providing in incentives to developers or builders to, to come to Summerside um, with our um, zoning bylaw and our official plan, being able to attract builders to certain, um, you know, levels of, of density and, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, we're not property managers, we're not developers, but we can, you know, create policies that attract those folks to building in Summerside versus somewhere else. Do you get a sense that developers want to build in Summerside? Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, and I, I can say that because they told us. Um, <laughs> our, our That's the best way to planning. answer that question. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm not making assumptions. I'm telling you what they're telling us. Um, I think our, well, I know our uh, our planning department, um, we're, we're trying all the time to um, you know, make it as easy as possible to get permits and that sort of thing with the, with the least amount of paperwork and red tape and hoops to jump through. Um, and and developers are are noticing that and they're they're you know they're thanking us for for, for taking steps to to make that happen. I just want I just I didn't know if you were ending there. Yeah, I, I didn't know if I was. So, no, no. But the question I have to sort of jump in on there is. Developers can't build without the infrastructure. Is yeah. is Summerside in a place right now where if tomorrow morning 10 developers come into your community and say, we want to build a, a sort of a, a condominium, they want to build a row of townhouses, Summerside would be available to do that because when developers look, because I'm just, I literally just sat down with three developers for a future episode of the show. And one of the reoccurring themes is they don't want to have to pay for the infrastructure upgrades that come with the housing challenges that municipalities are facing. So do you get in Summerside, are you preparing 
the community for future growth for when those developers do actually put that shovel in the ground, they can sort of say, okay, we're going to build and we're going to build it by 2025 to make sure people start getting that housing supply that they desperately need. Yeah, actually. Um, yeah, we are. Our, our municipal um, works department and our technical services department, which is what we call our planning department, um, every year at budget, we go through um, sort of capacity related presentations where the directors and managers look at how we're growing as a city and what our underground or our electrical infrastructure currently is and, and what we have to do to sort of evolve and, and improve to meet um, the rate at which people are developing. And so we've budgeted for, you know, lots and lots. Oh, there it is again. <laughs> I'll start, I'll start over. There you go. Um, so, so yeah, every, every year at budget time, our directors, um, yeah, they will present to us, um, what they suggest we do, um, whether that means increasing our sewage capacity or our water supply capacity or our electrical grid capacity. Um, so every every year we do take a look at how fast the city is expanding and and we're given a presentation um, and staff say, yeah, we're we're able to we're looking good or we're really going to need to in the next couple of years, look here or look there. Um, but yeah, no, we do we do regularly uh, look at that. And also whenever there is a rezoning um, application before us, like such as um, if a developer wants to increase the density of a certain parcel of land or parcels, we do look at what is there currently with respect to um, sewage and water supply and and will this increase in density, um, will it be able to, um, will, our, will our infrastructure be able to handle the increase in density if, if that application goes through and it's filled to, to, the, to the max? Um, every single planning board meeting we have where there's a rezoning, that's one of the questions, whether our infrastructure can handle the load. Um, and if it can, great. And if it can't, staff let us know and they'll say, you you might want to look at not approving this until we, we get a handle of our infrastructure requirements. Um, but typically it's always been, um, yes, it's able to handle this. So yeah, we're, we're, luck we're lucky that way. And I give credit to past councils who must have received those same presentations and and our infrastructure has been um you know upgraded or improved ever ever since as needed so yeah healthcare housing two very big macro issues at a macro level for a municipality to deal with and you're right i guarantee you if i came to somerville summerside which i'm coming to later on this year and i asked 100 people in your community in the downtown core what their big issues are probably hear those two top issues, but I'm going to hear a few micro issues as well. Potholes, parks, service levels, yeah. pool hours, this, that, and the other. How do you balance the needs of the community against the needs of the individual to quote my favorite Vulcan from uh, Star Trek <laughs> Wrath of Khan? How do you, how do you outweigh the needs of the many with the needs of the few? It's hard to answer that because but you've been elected to answer to be, it. <laughs> no, but I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make it in a way that, because it's, it's working really good here. Um, I'm trying to think of a, of a complaint that we get at that micro level. And my mind immediately just goes to snow removal. Um, <laughs> what you're saying that snow removal is of the contentious issue in Somerset yeah. and across Canada? Why what? wasn't my street done <laughs> first this time? Um, but when I think of, potholes and I, and I can only think of the messages or the calls or the emails that I get myself from residents because I can't speak for the other counselors I don't know what kind of micro pothole issues they're having in their areas but I don't but is it but do you I have don't to get say any. no to people because you because I'm assuming people have come to you and I hate to assume but I would hazard a guess that you have probably been approached by people saying we want this in our community but you know looking at your budget it's unrealistic to do some things in the yeah. municipal realm because you just don't have the budget to do it or it's not going to impact the entire community it's only going to impact a few people 
And you'll have to say no to, I don't want to say you'd have to say no to people, but you have to say something to them. Yeah. How hard is it to talk to people when they have very individual issues that they want solved on a citywide level? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, some of those little issues, we actually, some of those little issues we can deal with on an individual oh. basis. It, okay. it, it totally depends on on. I love this conversation because you're Financial you're blowing things. all my opinions on what I've had my <laughs> whole my, my whole show is about, and you're like Summerslide's just the canary in the coal mine a little bit here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll I'll just give you an example. Um, we have a street that is just in a quiet residential area. Um, it it has a ninety degree turn in it, and on that ninety degree turn there wasn't there is now there wasn't a, a center line um so i had a resident just just one resident reach out to me and say listen cars are going around this curve rather quickly and they're crossing over into the opposite lane um and in the mornings there's a, there can be a school bus there so i mean that might be the thing that did it but so i said okay i'll i'll do what I can do. And by saying that, I don't have any individual power. I cannot say, I'll get that fixed. Um, but what we typically do is we will get in touch with our CAO and say, listen, I heard from this resident about this issue. Is there anything you know that we can do here? Is it something simple or is it something that may seem simple but isn't? Um, so in that particular case, I mean, two days later, uh, I didn't even know it had been done, but I, I was emailed by this resident and she said, Thank you so much. There's a there's a yellow line in the <laughs> around the, the curve now, and I've been watching. And cars are, for the most part, the the same cars that have been going fast previously are now staying in their own lane. So that's just an example of one of the little things that might be easily fixable. But I mean, but who whoever says hundred bucks for the paint? Municipal government moves slow. Listen to that story and tell me that municipalities <laughs> don't move better than you anticipated. So I want to. And, and sometimes you don't know unless you ask. I mean, it's so simple to say, listen, CIO, is this a big thing? Like, can we get this done for this area? I agree with the resident. It's it's possibly unsafe. And nine times out of 10, it's a little issue like that that can just be fixed by sending a, a couple guys and a crew out and painting a line. It's not always uh, the big thing that 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 people may think it is. So do you think that more people should do that? Because you are the closest to the people. You don't go to Charlottetown to do your uh, job. You don't go to Ottawa to do your job. You're in your community. So when you go to the grocery store, I would hazard a guess that they probably know you a little bit better than they know your MLA or their MP. But they're, they, 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 they probably, and I don't want to say this disrespectfully, but they probably look at you and say, oh, he's probably busy, so I'm not going to approach him and I'm not going to ask him anything because I don't want to bother him. Would you rather people ask you those sort of micro questions to say, hey, counselor, I have an issue. Can we talk about it? Or would you rather sort of that be an email? I, I like the emails because it leaves a sort of a trail, but that doesn't mean I prefer email no i i i love talking about those little those little issues and yeah no i i wish more people would sort of approach me with those little things um but you heard I mean, it here first summer side approach them in the grocery <laughs> store <laughs> have to start office hours or something but no no i mean yeah it's okay i wish more I want people would but i'm yeah you can't always get what you want sometimes, but we'll change that. We're we'll changing it from this episode. <laughs> um, I want to flip the script a little bit. Every municipality has its challenges, and I agree that every municipality has their unique share of challenges. But what they also have is accomplishments, and they have things that they can be proud of. For you, looking at the city of Summerside as a whole, what's the thing you're most proud of when it comes to the community? When it comes to the community, I think our leadership in some of our energy um, initiatives, um, we, we, we have our own electrical utility. Um, so, you know, we have the biggest solar field east of Ontario. Um, we have our wind farm. Um, we're looking into, you know, hydrogen, um, that sort of thing. So, 
as a, as a whole community, I think our sort of our green initiative is something that I am extremely proud of because it's something that I've been a part of um, helping evolve just in the last six years. Um, and then there's, of course, there's infrastructure things like there's, there's our boardwalk, which is I think just over five kilometers long and, and people come in from out of town and they just cannot get over our boardwalk. Um, and then, there, I mean, there's always going to be, you're going to ask, you can ask any counselor what their individual accomplishments are. And, and I'm, how'd I you know what my follow-up question was going to be uh, their counselor? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's, there's one I'm particularly proud of, not because it was me, I did it, I did it, but because it was an issue for so many years that, you know, I, I was, I tried so hard when I got on council to be the one that sort of pushed it through. And it was a, uh, just a simple infrastructure related inter intersection type thing. We have, we, we had this intersection in Summerside here for decades and it was just, it, it didn't line up and it was just a disaster and council after council tried to get it aligned and, and there was land issues and, and so when we were first elected in, uh, or when I was first elected in 2018, that was one of the big things. And that was one of the things that residents, because my ward is in the area that this intersection is in. So, um, yeah, so we we got a roundabout put in after decades and it's fantastic. And people still thank me for the, for the roundabout. Um, and I say they thank me. I had, I will never take the, the single credit for that, but because, you know, it's always council, um, you know, council votes as a whole, but you know, I, I do feel a little bit proud as, as I feel like I, I'm sort of the one that sort of really kept it on track. Um, and I had the support of council, council the whole time. So, yeah. Uh, and it's a, and it's an intersection that the whole city uses. Before so, I, 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 hate to, I hate to answer that question with an intersection, but it, it was a big issue for the, for the city at the time. It really was. The great thing about this show is I, I think, and I'm going to toot my own horn a little bit here is, you know what? That is important for your community. That is an important thing. And it is dang well time that we start being proud of the small accomplishments in our communities. Yeah. Because we often forget about talking about them. So you know what? Roundabout. God bless you, counselor. <laughs> you got a roundabout and it's great to do that. <laughs> I'm turning to my last segment and it's my favorite subject because I like to talk about tourism and I had your mayor on uh, the political trenches a few weeks ago and it is now time to talk about tourism from your perspective. What are some of the hidden gems that Summerside has to offer tourists coming through its community? I'm not talking about the things that the province wants to talk about, but what about you? What are the tourist destinations you as a counselor say, if you come to Summerside, you need to see this. Definitely the boardwalk, although it's not so much a hidden gem, but it's 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 hidden until you get here and see it. Um, and then there's there's so many little um, little shops like uh, Holman's Ice Cream Parlor. Um, it's in a it's in a big heritage home, family owned business. Um, they make homemade ice cream. Um, there's there's so many of those. There's a little uh, Vietnamese restaurant just next door to City Hall, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, just little, little, little places like that, that you're not going to see in a, in a tourism brochure. Um, yeah. Is there a spot that you like to go to after a long day of work, after a long day of council meetings? Because I can imagine some of those council meetings can be quite long, particularly at budget time. Is there a spot in the community that you can go to and decompress after a long day and know that tomorrow morning, I'm going to have to get back up and do it all again to make my community a better place? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, everyone has their own sort of way to do that, whether it's, uh, you know, a couple drinks or, or a walk in the park. Um, but yeah, we have a, a beautiful uh, park, um, very relaxing if, if that's what your thing is. Um, other people, it's, you know, going to the gym and, and screaming at the top of the lungs. So, I mean, it, it'll, it'll differ from person to person, but. Um, well, what's that place for you? Home on the couch. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the most honest answer I get on this show when I ask that question. <laughs> it's on the uh, just home. A, just a walk around the neighborhood. Just a walk around the neighborhood. I mean, I don't oh, mean to, don't I don't try mean... sugarcoat it now, counselor. We heard <laughs> on, and then home we go to the on the couch. Oh darn! 
Lights off, lights off. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I want to ask the million dollar question now and wrap up because we're coming up to our 45 minute mark here. Um, in your opinion, counselor, what makes the city of Summerside such a unique place to live, to work, and to raise a family? That's a very good question because you could probably get the same answer in any city or town. Um, but I think it's just the, we're a city. I mean, we're approaching, I think, 16, 17,000 people. Um, but it really does have that small town feel still. Um, I mean, that that's a lot of people, but you cannot go to the grocery store or, uh, or the gas station or a restaurant without running into multiple people that you know. Um, and I think that's pretty special. Some people escape, want to escape that. Um, but I think even more people, after they do escape that, they they come back because of that. And I think that's, a, and that's something we hear a lot here in Summerside is that, you know, you finish high school and kids just want to get out and they don't like it because it's too slow paced or, or whatever, but they keep coming back home. And we, we hear that a lot about Summerside. And I think that's what kind of, I think that's what makes it a really, really special place when, when people realize that and, and yeah. Okay. Now you said that, and I said that was going to be the last question, but now you've asked now you've got brought up my one question that I <laughs> traditionally don't ask unless, it, unless it, you bring it up. So I'm going to ask how, how is it to go run into a get, how, how hard is it for you to run into a grocery store to get a carton of milk without stopping to talk to someone about something going on in your community? And does your wife and kids just not go with you anymore because they know <laughs> you're going to get stopped and talk about council related issues again? The trick is to go very late on Saturday nights. No, um, <laughs> no, I mean, that's just not really something that happens to me. People don't, people don't come up. I, they really don't. I mean, regularly, I, the odd time, sure. Um, it just doesn't happen. And I don't know why, because it happens to other counselors. I don't know. I don't know. I don't wear a mask. I, I don't know. Well, this summer, when I'm in Summerside, I'm going to find a grocery store. I'm going to hunt <laughs> you down and I'm going to stop you. <laughs> so there you go. Counselor, <laughs> I, I appreciate you taking time out of your business schedule to do this. I'm so happy that we met at FCM. We got to know each other and we've connected and we've sort of made uh, a mutual friendship through municipalities. And I so appreciate you taking time and sitting down and talking about Summerside, yourself, and uh, some of the great tours and destinations that I'm about to see this summer. So thank you so much. Thank you. And you're very welcome. If I can, if I can just pay you a, a compliment, <laughs> um, you just, no, no, it's, it's good. I, so often when we're interviewed by whether it's a newspaper or, or the CBC, I find it very, I don't think intimidating is the word, but sometimes it's so hard to talk to those journalists. Sometimes it isn't, but I just wanted to thank you for making it so easy and, and it just laid back and just very easy to talk to and, and answer. It's just, I wish more. Uh, I wish more outlets were were like that. But no, just thank you for making it so comfortable. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our great conversations that we have coming up. And when we return for season seven of the Cross Border Interviews in September later this year. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always. Just keep talking, guys.